It's great to be with you for the 23rd Sunday after Pentecost. Today we're going to be looking at the psalm, the second reading, and then the gospel reading. First of all, the psalm, Psalm 98. Sing a new song to the Lord who has done marvelous things. I wanted to talk a little bit about the whole concept of new songs and old songs. What do you think is the right balance between old songs and new songs? I remember in the mid-80s, the church I was pastor of in Southern California, we had a long-range planning process. Each group was asked to do its goals, establish its goals for one year, five years, and ten years, and then also to have goals for the church. And I remember the men's Bible study group. Their two goals were to gain new members and to stay the same. But as far as the goals that people had for the congregation, uh, the uh, number one and two goals were New Sanctuary and Fellowship Hall, and that led to a major building program from 86 to 92. But the third goal was to sing more familiar hymns. We had a music director who liked to introduce all sorts of new hymns, and, and people said, we want to sing more familiar hymns. So imagine that. That's one of the top priorities, singing more familiar hymns. So I asked the question, what old songs would you not want to give up? And what new songs now do you especially like and do especially speak to you and your life? And how does a song become one of your favorite songs? Is it the message? Is it the melody? Is it something that you learned when you were a child? How does a song become one of your favorite songs? Uh, one person said that songs are buckets of memories. And isn't that the case that we hear a song, um, a, a Christian song or a, or a secular song, and it brings back all sorts of memories. For example, I remember in watching the movie Born on the Fourth of July, and they had various, uh, you know, uh, hits from the late 60s and early 70s, and, and those songs brought back all sorts of memories. So sing to the Lord a new song. Then verses 2 and 3. O Lord, you have made known your victory, and you remember your steadfast love and faithfulness. Victory, steadfast love, and faithfulness. And so I ask, what songs especially speak to you of God's victory over sin, death, and the power of the devil? I think of crown him with many crowns. Like, you know, the one verse, crown him the Lord of life who triumphed o'er the grave. That was always the hymn that we closed Easter Sunday services with. And so what songs speak to you of God's victory over sin, death, and the power of the devil? What songs especially remind you of God's steadfast love and faithfulness? I think of the song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. I remember when I went back to uh, my college class's 50th anniversary reunion in 19, uh, 2019. And we had a time of singing, and I remember that one of the songs that we sang was Great is Thy Faithfulness. And the person who was leading the singing said, and it was powerful, he said, I'm sure that that song means more to us today than it did 50 years ago. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. Verses 5 and 6, sing to the Lord with the harp, the harp, the voice of song, with trumpets and the sound of the horn, shout with joy before the Lord. And so I ask the question, what musical instruments do you especially like to have as part of your worship? Could it be a harp on Christmas Eve or trumpets on, on Reformation Sunday and on Easter? You know, what musical instruments do you especially uh, find inspiring when they are part of the worship service? Verses 7 and 8, let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those that dwell therein. Let the rivers clap their hands and let the hills ring out with joy before the Lord. Another, uh, another psalm verse says, let the trees clap their hands. All of creation join in singing. That reminds me of Luke 1940 on Palm Sunday when the Pharisees were all uptight because, uh, and the Sadducees, the uh, religious and secular leaders, that Jesus, uh, all this cheering for you is going to make the uh, Romans really nervous and really upset, and, and they may re who knows what they might do to us. Tell them to be silent. Tell your followers to be silent. And Jesus said something that's in Luke that's not in the other Gospels. 
I tell you, if these my people were silent, the rocks would shout out. That would be the world's first rock concert. Can you imagine what it would be like if all the rocks shouted, shouted out and Jerusalem area was full of rocks? I would not want to have a bunch of stones have to do what I should be doing. I want, if creation is praising God, I want to be praising him as well. Now let's turn to the second reading from Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians. Um, in the explanation of the readings, it says, some members of the Thessalonian community, because of their belief in the nearness of Christ's return, had ceased to work. Uh, if if uh, Paul was able to only be there a short time before he got driven out of town, one of the things he must have talked about was Jesus' return. He didn't have a chance to say a whole lot more before he got driven out of town. And so they heard that. They picked up on that and said, well, if Jesus is coming back, why go to work? I remember someone once asked Martin Luther, if you knew the world would end tomorrow, what would you do? And he said, I'd plant a tree. You know, so, but how many of us, if we knew the world would end tomorrow, would say, or end soon, say, well, I'm not going to go to work anymore. The problem is that those who stopped working had to start living off of other people. They started living off the generosity of other members. And so Paul is very blunt here. The writer of this letter, Paul, warns them, if you want to eat, then you need to work. You need to not live off of the generosity of other people. I'm going to be mentioning later as we study this, it's, it's interesting how the Bible speaks of we need to have a concern for the poor, but it also says that it's not right to have people who can work living off of uh, those who are working. It's not right for some people to live off of other people. Now, he's going to be, we're going to be making reference to Corinth, and so I want to take a look at the map so we can see where these towns are. This is where Paul went on his second missionary journey as he uh, came up through here, came into northern Greece, and then came to Thessalonica, and then later came down to Athens, and then to Corinth down to here. And so you kind of get a way of, uh, an idea of how these, uh, where these places are located. So Paul says to the church there in his second letter, We command you, beloved, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from believers who are living in idleness and not according to the tradition that they have received from us. You know, idleness is the workshop of the devil. People who are idle get bored, and, when, and, and that's often where problems can, can happen, where people don't have enough to do. And then Paul says, For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. That reminds me of what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. I give that verse there. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. I don't think that's a boastful statement. Instead, I think Paul knew that people needed a specific good example of the way that they also should live. And so he sought to be a good example for them. And he also was a good example for them in keeping busy and working and not being idle and living off of other people who are working. He describes what he was like there when he was at Thessalonica. Verses 7 to 9. We were not idle when we were with you, and we did not eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day, so that we might not burden any of you. It's not that we didn't have the right to feel that we, need, we, we should be fed something, you know, there, we should receive something for the work, Christian work that we were doing, but we needed to make sure that we gave you an example to imitate. Now, in the account in Acts, Paul was in Thessalonica just a short time, and so it doesn't specifically mention his uh, working, but it does mention it in Acts 18, a little bit later, when Paul went down to Corinth. It says, and I quote that on the study sheet, in Corinth, Paul went to see Aquila and Priscilla, two Jews who had recently gotten kicked out of Rome. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and they worked together. By trade, they were tent makers. And so in Corinth today, there's the Agora, the marketplace, and on the sides around the perimeter of the Agora, there are a number of these shops. 
And um, so it probably was a shop like this that Aquila and Priscilla had. And you would do your work, your tent making, and your business here at the lower level, and then there would be an upper level. And so uh, you would live here, and your business would be here, and so you'd have a really nice short commute, kind of working at home and, and uh, living at work and so on. So it was in a place like that that Paul had worked with Aquila and Priscilla as a tent maker. Now, there are people today who talk about themselves as having a tent-making ministry, as there are more and more congregations who um, find that they're no longer able to afford a full-time pastor, or they used to have a part-time pastor and are not able to afford that, and it becomes more and more of an issue of how, um, how do churches afford pastors and how do pastors also afford to be able to be pastors. And so many talk about themselves as either bivocational or as having a tent-making ministry. And this is uh, the, the, that phraseology comes from, from this reference here where Paul said, I supported myself by making tents with Aquila and Priscilla. That was the work I was used to when I was growing up. And so therefore, I did not live off of you. So, uh, Paul, let's go back now to what Paul says to the Thessalonians. Even when we were with you, we gave you this command. Anyone unwilling to work should not eat. For we hear that some of you are living in idleness, mere busybodies, not doing any work. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. And so I ask the question, how do you maintain a balance between caring for the poor which the Bible definitely exhorts us to do, and not letting certain people live off of other people, which the Bible also speaks against. How do you maintain the right balance between the two? Those both are taught in the scriptures. And then Paul writes, brothers and sisters, do not be weary in doing what is right. So I ask the question, how are you doing at not being weary in doing what is right. What do you do when you start getting weary doing what is right? And what helps you not grow weary in doing what is right? For me, one of the best parts of retirement is being able to take naps. And I'll take two or three 10 to 15 minute power naps per day. And it's just absolutely wonderful to be able to do so. And, um, you know, and it's like I can get tired and I take a 10 to 15 minute nap and I'm ready to go back and work again. So to me, just being able to take a nap is one of the best ways to not grow weary in doing what is right. How do you do at not growing weary at doing what is right? Now, let's now turn to the gospel. This um, section, Luke 21, what, what Jesus says here is also found in the other two of what are called the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, synoptic, they see with, they see together, they include many of the same things. This is um, in Luke 21, Mark 13, and Matthew 24. Um, this is often called the Olivet Discourse because um, Jesus gave, spoke these words from the, after leaving the temple from the Mount of Olives as he was looking across the Kidron Valley to the temple. Let's get, uh, let's get kind of a sense of uh, what we're going to be looking at. First of all, we have here a, a diagram which shows where um, the um, Temple Mount was located, and then you had the Kidron Valley, you had the Garden of Gethsemane, and over here is the Mount of Olives. And so Jesus and the disciples are at the Temple Mount, and then they go over here to the Mount of Olives. Uh, let's look at the next picture. There is in Jerusalem today at a hotel, the Holy Land Hotel, a model of what Jerusalem looked like in the second temple period. This would be the temple, um, uh, the temple of Jesus' day. 
and it was, uh, you can see here, the Fortress Antonia. It's a Roman fortress that was overlooking the temple area, so the, the Roman soldiers are able to keep uh, track of everything. And here you have the, the temple itself. Um, Herod the Great, the Herod of Jesus' birth, had built a retaining wall, a great retaining wall around the area, and then had greatly expanded the temple area. And so this is what the temple would have looked like, and it was a grand structure. We're going to be looking at a picture of the western wall. Um, maybe if we can just kind of go back to the previous picture for a second. Um, the western wall would be the wall here, you know, the exterior wall over here. So the western wall is not a wall of a temple, but the western wall is a wall of the retaining wall around the temple. So here is the western wall today. Uh, some of, one of the things that you'll, the, the prayer area divided between men are over here, women are over here. And as you look at these stones, notice the big stones are here. And then as you get up higher, it's just sort of small kind of scrappy stuff. But the Herodian construction would have been massive stones, perfectly shaped with a perimeter around the edge and, and this would have been the massive construction of the Herodian period. There is a tunnel right here that you can go down. And in the next picture is a picture of the largest known stone from the Herodian construction. You can see how huge it is. And then you can also see how perfectly formed it is, as well as the perimeter around it. And so this was a massive, massive construction project. So let's uh, look at the next picture then. This is the view from the Mount of Olives today, looking across to Temple Mount and on the area where the temple used to be before it was destroyed in 70 AD is now a, um, the, Ma, the, the Dome of the Rock, a, a Muslim um, worship, a place of worship. And inside this Dome of the Rock is a huge rock, and, and the rock is, is, the, uh, is believed to be the place where Muhammad was on his horse, and he jumped up into heaven and made a trip to heaven from. And so this is uh, what's now located where the is, uh, Jewish temple used to be. So now, let's now go to the account in Luke 21. And we're going to notice some slight differences between the account in Luke and Mark and Matthew that each kind of gives out some unique sense of the meaning. First, in Luke's account, verses 5 and 6, when some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God. What, what is emphasized here? The beautiful stones and gifts, the beauty of the stones and the gifts dedicated to God. One of the things that's interesting here is that this account comes right after the account of, you know, the rich people who are giving abundantly and, and the woman who just gave the two small copper coins, but Jesus said she gave more because she gave all that she had. And so right after the account of people giving gifts to God is this description of the temple as adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God. And from what Jesus is saying, all of this is going to be torn down. So all of this prideful giving is not going to last. Instead, it's go towards a building that is going to be destroyed. So Jesus said, as for these things that you see, as they look at the beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another, all will be thrown down. Now, Another thing that's interesting in Luke's account is that the question, when will this be, is described as asked immediately afterwards. In Mark and Luke, in Matthew, it's described later when they were in private because it's, um, Jesus has just said something and, and when is the temple going to be destroyed and, and what's this all about? You know, th this is kind of a risky, dangerous thing to ask that kind of a question with all sorts of people milling around. But Luke has the question asked immediately uh, rather than later and in private. Mark, when Mark gives the account, 
As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. The emphasis there is not on the beauty of the stones and the gifts, but instead upon their size, which also is significant. And when he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, it was later, do you remember we showed that the Mount of Olives is to the east, and there you can look over at the temple, and it was there on the Mount of Olives that Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked him privately. This was now a private conversation, not a public conversation. And when we see the conversation, you can see why it's one that you probably would want to have in private. Matthew 24, as Jesus came out of the temple and was going away, his disciples came to point out to him the buildings. It's not talking about the beauty of the stones and the gifts. It's not talking about the size of the stones, but instead it's talking about the buildings. And then Matthew also has the subsequent conversation when they are on the Mount of Olives overlooking the temple and in private. And when he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And so you see that there's an element here in Matthew that is not in Mark and Luke. In Mark and Luke, it's talking about the destruction of the temple, which happened in 70 A.D. And in Matthew, the issue is not just the destruction of the temple, but the second return of Jesus and the end of the age. And, and, and you see how there's that additional topic as well. But what is Jesus saying? We're going to be looking at what he's, how, how he answered that question in Luke 21, because he really gives them warning. It's going to be tough. You know, there are some really bad days coming up, leading up to the destruction of the temple, the dispersion of the Jewish people. The, um, um, the original Christians in that area were all Jewish. The Jews became Christians, but, but there was increasing antagonism towards the Christians. Uh, there, there was even a a movement at one time where included within the Jewish service in the synagogue was a curse upon Christians, and they would have people stationed along the walls that would watch to see who doesn't say that part of the service. So you can see that this obviously is written at a time of increased antagonism between the Jewish people and the Jewish people who had become Christians. Beware, it's going to be tough. Beware that you are not uh, led astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he. Do not go after them. And when you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified. For these things must first take place, but the end will not follow immediately. It's going to be tough. You can see how he's warning the people. It's going to be tough. I'm warning you ahead of time, so you'll be prepared. Uh, the end will not follow immediately. Nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdoms. Um, I remember when I was in elementary school hearing a uh, Bible camp teacher talk about the next phrase. There will be great earthquakes. You notice here it's comma and in various places famines and plagues. Well, she was using a translation, there will be great earthquakes in various places, in diverse places. And she was saying that, that um, see, it, it's predicting there are going to be earthquakes where earthquakes aren't happening, haven't happened before, and that's happening now, and obviously the second coming is just around the corner. A lot of people who really are emphasizing the signs of the times leading up to the second coming of Jesus will be using this passage of Scripture. There will be great earthquakes. Well, this was in a rift zone. The Jordan Valley is a rift zone. And in various places, famines and plagues will be dreadful portents and signs of heaven. Um, before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. Again, um, uh, generally it's believed that, um, the, the, the question is whether, that generally it's believed that Mark wrote first in the 60s, and then Matthew and Luke took Mark and added some information, 
And the question is, written, is whether they were written before or after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. But it's saying it's going to be tough. This is obviously coming at a time of great antagonism towards the Jewish Christians from the Jews who are not Christians. Before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons. That shows kind of like, notice the combination of synagogues and prisons. It shows the, 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 the antagonism of, of that, that particular time. Uh, you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, or I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. I remember there was a young man um, in, um, in our church in Southern California, and he went on, and was um, on a ship doing missionary work. And, and he used that verse to say that whenever he was asked to tell about the trip, he didn't need to prepare because God said, I will give you words and wisdom when you are ready to speak. And so he thought that that was, that was, a, that was a, a, a message to him that he didn't need to prepare. And whenever he spoke, you could tell that he didn't prepare. And God, God did not give him words and wisdom that was, um, was astounding. So I don't think he interpreted it in the right way. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives, friends, They'll put some of you to death. You will be hated. It's going to be tough. But by your endurance, you will gain your souls. I'm warning you ahead of time so that when it happens, you won't get caught off guard. Now, I wanted to look at a few verses that are actually after, uh, that are in Luke 21, but come after the, the, the gospel reading for November 13. Um, in Luke, Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, this is when the Romans came in in 70 AD and destroyed the city and, and, tore, and, and just tore everything apart and enslaved the Jewish people. And I've read that there were so many Jewish people that were enslaved that the, there was such a gut of slaves in the Roman Empire that the price of slaves plummeted throughout the empire because there were so many Jews that were enslaved. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Now it's interesting, when Matthew does this, it's a little bit different. He says, when you see the desolating sacrilege in the temple that Daniel had talked about, then you know that the end is near. Uh, Daniel had talked about the, uh, the, the Syrian king slaughtering a pig on the altar. What happened here with Jerusalem is that the Roman army brought its symbols of Roman Empire into the temple and that absolutely freaked out the Jewish people. And then Matthew includes an interesting statement. It puts in parenthesis then in uh, let the reader understand. Obviously that wasn't part of Jesus' uh, words because you know Jesus is speaking and this is speaking to the reader. And so with the addition of let the reader understand, it suggests that the time where it's going to happen is very, very soon. Know that its desolation has come near. And those in Judea must flee to the mountains. If you're outside the city, don't go outside back into the city. Pray that you are not pregnant. Flee. You know, it's going to be terrible. Verse 24, Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now this also is a verse that got uh, biblical prophecy people just absolutely going. Here we're going to see a map here. Do you remember the Sixth Day War in June of 1967? Do you remember there were um, Arab peoples from all sides of Israel that attacked? This is what Israel looked like prior to 1967. There was a thin corridor, and Israel, um, nation of Israel, only had the western part of Jerusalem. And in the Six Day War, um, Israel gained the Golan Heights over here, the Gaza Strip over here, and the Sinai Peninsula over here. So here we have Israel before the Six Day War, and here we have Israel after the Six Day War. And so you can see how the 
Biblical prophecy people just said, aha, the 1967 60 war, the second coming is just about here because Jesus said, Jerusalem be trampled on by the Gentiles in the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Well, that's what can I say? There'll be signs in the sun, moon, stars, people will faint from fear. Oh, let me just go back to um, in 19, let's see, if not an interesting thing here, um, it was. Um, um, Jimmy Carter uh, had the peace talks with Menachem Begin from Israel and Anwar Sadat from Egypt. And so from those uh, pre-1980 peace talks, um, Israel started to give back the Sinai Peninsula. And the first time I was in Israel was in uh, May and June of 1980. And at this point, uh, the Sinai Peninsula had been given back right about to here. And so it was interesting going from Tel Aviv to Cairo. We had to take a bus from Tel Aviv to, Cai to the no man's land, the Israeli side. And then we had to take a bus from the Israel side of no man's land to the Egyptian side of no man's land. And then they had all these taxis. And we had to take a taxi from the Egyptian side of the no man's land of the Suez Canal. And then they had rafts where you would uh, cross the Suez Canal in a raft. And they had all these taxis, so then you could uh, then take a taxi to Cairo. And the border opened on June 1st of 1980, and my friend and I took that route on June 2nd of 1980. And by 1982, things had developed where you could take a bus all the way, with the same bus, all the way from Tel Aviv across the Jewish area, no man's land, the Egyptian area, and they had big ferries where the bus could get on the ferry and then go the rest of the way to, um, to Cairo. So, but this shows the difference in Israel before and after the Six Day War. So you can see how some people are going to say, aha, that's what Jesus was talking about in verse 24. Signs in the sun, moon, and stars, people will faint. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And this is quoting from the book of Daniel. Now these things, be, these things begin, when these things begin to break place, stand up, raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. And again, remember that in Matthew, the, ref, the question is not just about the destruction of the temple, but it's also about the end of the age. But in Luke and Mark, that question about the end of the age is not part of the question that was asked. But either way, I suppose the lesson is for us. Jesus said it's going to be tough. Knowing that ahead of time helps us to be prepared, helps us to be faithful, helps us to not grow weary in doing what is right. And so let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the old songs that bring back so many great memories. We thank you for the new songs, songs that can express our faith in a way that maybe none of the old songs quite do. We thank you for songs. We thank you for the way in which creation praises you, and we pray that we won't let just creation do what we also should be doing. We pray that we will not grow weary in doing from doing what is right. We pray that you will renew our strength so that we are able to keep on doing what is right. We also thank you, Lord Jesus, that as we go through the toughest of times, as you described here in the Olivet Discourse, we have the promise of your presence, your strength, seeing us through. And in your name we pray. Amen.